Our next speaker is going to be Sarah Rouhani Fard, who is a colleague here in the Department of Bioengineering at Northeastern University. Um, thank you, Nicolai, for the invitation to speak. Um, as you can see from my first slide, we're sort of taking a sharp turn and we're going to be talking about imaging data. Um, so this is going to be primarily work that I did during my postdoc in Arjun Raj's lab. Um, where I developed a tool for signal amplification of looking at individual RNAs in single cells. So the traditional way to look at, actually, can we turn down the lights a little bit? It's mostly imaging data I'm going to talk about. Um, so the traditional way to look at RNAs in single cells is using single molecule RNA fish. And the way that this is done, and what we're looking at here is a plane of cells. It's okay, we can... You can do this in the dark. <laughs> Just don't fall asleep. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at here is a plane of uh, cultured mammalian cells, and each of these single dots here is one RNA. Uh, and the way that we do this is by designing short DNA oligonucleotide probes that are tiled across your target mRNA sequence. And these are about 20 mers each. Uh, so then each of these DNA probes has the same fluorophore on it. So it's single fluorophore on each of these probes. Uh, now, each of these individual probes will probably bind specifically to your target, but it'll probably also bind non-specifically all over your cell because DNAs are kind of sticky. So you can see there's sort of like some haze in this one. That's probably a bunch of single ones that are binding non-specifically there. Um, but when we tile a whole bunch of these, let's say 20 of these individual probes, it'll have local amplification, um, and you'll get these tiny white spots here. So then when we're on the microscope and we take a stack image all the way through the cell, you get a nice quantitative picture of what is going on transcriptionally inside of that single cell. So what you can't tell from this image is that this signal is relatively dim. Uh, it looks pretty bright in this picture, but that's because I've zoomed in to 100x and I'm using very long exposure times to look at it. Edge of the stage. Um, so now, uh, here I'm showing you again 100x microscopy, like I showed in the previous slide. The signal is nice and bright, but on that same set of cells, when I zoom out to 20x, you can no longer see it. Um, and when you do that, it limits your applications for what you can do with it. And I'll try to weave in during the talk where uh, proteomics is relevant to this. And I think the approaches that I talk about are complementary to some of the approaches that, that you all are taking. So the low uh, signal is limiting our applications, one of which is high throughput screening. Um, if you wanted to do high throughput screening with a traditional method, uh, your power is going to be low because you only have a few cells represented in each position on your microscope. So it's also going to limit flow cytometry, which is an obvious application for single cell proteomics. Um, if you wanted to separate your cells based on their transcriptional activity, you can't do that using traditional methods. And then finally, really important right now in the field, uh, looking at RNA on tissues. That is not what you're looking at here. This is antibody staining um, of some random proteins. But uh, to look at RNA on tissues is complicated because tissues have really high background. Um, so when you're dealing with something that has low signal to begin with, it's going to get drowned out in the noise. Uh, so what we need is something, a way to do signal amplification that maintains specificity and uh, the signal will increase exponentially to suit our needs. So what I developed was a probe scheme called clamp fish, click amplifying fish. So the first thing we wanted to do was achieve specificity. If you have nonspecific binding in an amplification setting, it's a problem because your nonspecific binding is going to amplify the same way that your specific binding will. So it'll look like a real spot. So what we wanted to do was achieve specificity here. So we thought a proximity ligation would be a good way to go. Uh, so we designed DNA oligonucleotide probes uh, that were complementary uh, to our target RNA sequence. And we thought that if we put them in direct proximity to each other, that would help us achieve specificity. Um, the problem was that if we do it this way and we have a way to conjugate these to each other, the probability of these two non-specifically binding is low but you don't have, one, you don't have a means of amplifying your signal here, um, and two, these will watch, wash away during any stringency washes. 
So what we did was we decided to loop these two pieces together. So now we have a complementary region on the five prime and three prime ends that's looped together. And then we uh, installed a five prime alkyne and three prime azide onto them. Using click chemistry, we click the ends. So what this effectively does, when you think of DNA probes binding to a target, you think of them sort of sitting linearly on top of it. But you're actually forming a DNA-RNA hybrid. Uh, so that hybrid has a um, double helix. So it's wrapping around itself. So when we click the ends together, we're actually forming a loop around our target sequence. So then using stringency washes, you could wash away the unbound probe and maintain your specific probe in the spot that you want. So then how do we amplify the fluorescence signal? The primary probe doesn't have any fluorophore on it, but we do iterative rounds of the same thing. So for every one primary probe, we put two secondary probes that have a fluorescent label on them, and then you keep doing iterative rounds of hybridization going back and forth between secondary and tertiary probes uh, to uh, achieve your desired level of amplification. So what does that look like on cells? This is at round two. Um, I've contrasted it so that you can see the difference between round two and round eight for this particular slide, but at round two, this is roughly the equivalent of what a single molecule fish image would look like. So you would actually be able to see spots here. So round four, same cell, round six, and round eight. So we can see that the signal is growing, which is what we wanted to see. So now just to show you some uh, specificity controls, here, what we're looking at is GFP positive cells and GFP negative cells. So what I've targeted here is the GFP mRNA. Uh, so this is a genetic negative control. I've taken it to round 12, which is quite high. There's very few applications that you would actually need to go that high, just to highlight what the background actually is here. Uh, so you have really high, pretty even amplification here. Um, here, you have some spots that are showing up mostly on the glass, but your cell is otherwise pretty much negative on your negative control. So then what's the difference if you don't click? Um, for the positive click reaction, you have pretty even amplification. A lot of the spots will actually fall off if you don't click them because you're relying completely on hybridization, which will get you part of the way there. It will amplify because the probes will just bind. But um, clicking it will keep it even throughout the entire cell. So. One of the things I talked about was that when you're zoomed in at 100x magnification, you have very few cells represented in each position on your microscope. Um, so here I'm showing you 100x imaging, single molecule fish on the left, and then clamp fish on the right. Both of them look pretty good. Likewise for 60x imaging, um, but you still don't have that many cells here. When you get down to lower magnification, where we have a lot more cells represented, such as 20x imaging, um, you're starting to lose your signal on your single molecule fish, but you can still see where your clamfish signal is here. And likewise for 10x imaging, when we see a lot more cells, um, our sampling efficiency is much higher. Um, you can still detect which cells are positive and which cells are negative by clampfish. So we've decreased our magnification that we could do that and increased our ability to do high throughput assays. So like I said, this will enable some high throughput scanning. Um, so one of the things you might consider doing on this is in a 96 well plate format, what is the effect of X drug or X 96 drugs on your transcriptional levels? Um, wouldn't be very efficient to do this um, position by position at 100x imaging. Um, just to show you the difference, if you wanted to scan a single well by single molecule fish, one well on a 96 well plate would take you about four hours. By clamfish, it would only take you, take you about 20 minutes per well. Um, and this can really aid in something like rare cell analysis, where you're looking at, you're looking for a phenotype that's like one in 100,000 cells. It's not very practical to just hunt for it when you're looking at five or six cells at a time. What you really want to do is be able to scan the entire well and be able to pick out which ones are positive and which ones are negative. So then the ability to multiplex is really important here, and this really allows us to do that, and this is one of the strengths of the protocol. Um, so you can multiplex and amplify at the same time. Uh, so what you do here is you design your primary probes with different backbones, and then you can design uh, secondary and tertiary probes that are complementary just to that 
specific backbone that you're interested in, and you could theoretically go as high as you want with this. You're, you're not limited because you can program the backbone of your probes to whatever you want, um, as long as you have unique amplifiers for each one. Um, and then at the end, we do single molecule fish and different uh, fluorophores. So you could multiplex this further than three, but what I'm showing here is the neat one link RNA, which we expect to be expressed in the nucleus and nuclear paraspeckles, HIST1H4E, which is a marker of S phase, so you expect it to be positive or negative, positive in about 60% of the sample. Um, and then LMNA, which we expect to be positive in all of the samples because it's a housekeeping gene, and then we overlaid all of them together. And we could also do it at low magnification for all of them. So now, talked about low magnification. Um, in a healthcare setting, in a diagnostic setting, um, what we really want to be able to do is look at uh, our distributions in multiplex at low magnification, because low magnification uh, is helpful for looking at structures on tissues. So what we're looking at here is a mouse kidney sample, and I've stained it for pod XL mRNA, and what we expected to see here was a circle around the podocytes in this particular slice, and this is a fixed frozen section. Everything I've talked about is on fixed, formaldehyde fixed uh, cells. So uh, here we're talking about uh, podocytes, which was the expected location. Uh, we saw that it co-localized with the single molecule fish signal, which was very dim. We had to zoom in quite far. Uh, what we were surprised to see was signal in this region. Um, we had no idea what we were looking at. I presented this at a conference, and uh, there happened to be a kidney pathologist at the conference um, who said that what we're lighting up there is the endothelium that has known levels of pod XL mRNA in it. This was something we didn't expect because we couldn't see it by single molecule fish. So I went back and I zoomed in and I was detecting these tiny, uh, these tiny spots there. So it was something that we, weren't, we didn't even know was gonna be there and this was showing us that it was there. So this is actually, um, told you I would weave in a little bit of stuff that I thought would be a, a good um, complementary method for proteomics. This leads to uh, a project that I'm starting uh, with Nikolai, actually, um, where we're going to try to pair proteomics with spatial transcriptomics. Um, so imagine you have your paired uh, RNA-seq with your single cell proteomics from the same cells, and you have your spatial transcriptome. One of the questions we're asking is, can we use the RNA-seq from our paired RNA-seq proteomics to map the proteome back to the transcriptome on the tissue, on the tissue slice? So that's uh, one way that I think the, the tools can be complementary. So now, going back to this image, uh, we have a heterogeneous population of uh, single cells, uh, different RNA levels in each. We have it super high in this one. We have a few RNAs in this one. We have none in this one. Uh, what's the difference between them? If we could sort these, uh, we could have access to more tools that we could see them better. Uh, so we wanted to see, um, with this tool, since it was brighter now, um, since we could amplify as far as we want and maintain specificity, could we now sort our populations of cells based on the levels of RNA expression? So what we did was we took GFP positive and GFP negative cells. Um, the GFP mRNA was nice and highly expressed, so this was a good tool for us to figure out what it was doing here. Um, so we put them together 50-50 in a tube, um, and we labeled them to round four with clamp fish uh, in the same fluorophore, um, and the GFP positive cells were obviously green, so we knew which population was which. By single molecule fish, I chose this one so you could see a difference in signal rather than just the two spectra on top of each other. Um, so the green is showing you the GFP positive cells uh, labeled in clamp fish, or sorry, labeled with single molecule fish, and then the black is showing you the GFP negative cells. So you have just a kind of a close separation there. Um, when you add clamp fish to it, um, in this case, it's to round eight, you get a nice big separation between the two. Um, so this was a GFP, so a lot more than you would expect in an endogenously expressed target. Um, so we wanted to see how would this look for an endogenously expressed target where the difference in uh, number of mRNAs per cell is gonna be less. Um, so we chose HIST1H4E, which is a marker of S phase, 
and NEAT1, which is a link RNA. So neither of these targets has an antibody that can be used for them. Uh, NEAT1, obviously, because it's a link RNA, it doesn't have a protein that the antibody can target. Um, HIST1H4E just doesn't happen to have an antibody that targets the, the full link protein. Um, so we took them to round four of clampfish, and then we saw that HIST1H4E had two populations two clouds that were showing up next to each other. And for NEAT1, you expect it to be expressed um, ubiquitously in all of your cells, but some cells have much larger paraspeckles than others. So we wanted to see if we could detect a difference between the two in our cloud that showed up on the flow cytometry data. So then we sorted those. And for HIST1H4E, this is a cyto this some mRNA, so you expect to see it in the cytoplasm. Um, for the low ones, we found that they had just a few mRNAs expressed in the cytoplasm, whereas the high ones, as expected, had a lot in the cytoplasm. Likewise, for the NEAT1, um, the low ones had fewer and smaller paraspeckles as compared to the high ones that had a lot more. Um, so I think this is another kind of obvious way that single cell proteomics would come into play here or could come into play here. Um, if we want to interpret heterogeneity in our proteomics data, in our single cell proteomics data, maybe we could eliminate some of the heterogeneity from transcription. So if you sort your cells on a given RNA level for a given RNA and then analyze your single cell proteomics data, um, perhaps it gives you a cleaner data set. Just, a, just an idea. So then, uh, this is the, the last thing I'll talk about here. Um, so when I was talking about RNA so far, um, for RNA, it's a, a little easier to target RNA versus DNA because RNA is single-stranded, um, and it's also primarily in the cytoplasm. When you want to target DNA, there's some extra challenges. Um, primarily, well, one is because it's located in the nucleus, so your probe needs to actually access the nucleus. And two, uh, your DNA is double-stranded. So in order for your probe actually to bind to it, you need to denature your DNA. Um, and this is much harsher on the cell, and uh, it's much harder to do DNA fish um, because of that. The, the conditions are just much more stringent on your cells. Um, so we were able to do DNA clamfish and amplify the signal um, on 5S ribosomal DNA. Um, this is a repeat sequence. There's about 90 repeats, and it was just using one probe. Um, so we were very nicely able to see where all the DNA pieces are. Um, and then we were also able to do RNA and DNA fish on top of each other to look at them together. Uh, so the way that we did this was we did the RNA fish, and since everything's locked in place, um, it was able to withstand the stringency needed to denature for the DNA fish for the secondary detection. And with that, that's all I have. Um, just started the lab, so we're recruiting. So if you know anyone, please send them my way. And thank you to the Raj Lab that most of this work was done in. Thank you, Sarah. Questions for Sarah? I can see one at the back. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, one thing we often struggle with when we're probing for specific genes in um, tissues is when the gene is small or if we're looking for a specific uh, splice form, um, because often these single molecule methods require many, many tiled probes. I wondered if clampfish might be useful for that because you have the potential to amplify just one event and be stringent after you do the, the, the click reaction. I don't know if you've looked at that, I was curious. Yeah, so we could get the probe down to, uh, I, I don't quite have it down to a single primary probe yet, but the single primary probe will bind to a 30 mer region. Um, we can definitely do it with two or three probes. Um, so that'll get you down to 90 nucleotides. So uh, that, that probably matches most. The only thing we really, as far as I know, that we really can't detect is microRNAs because they're too short. They're not quite 30 yet. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience fixing the cells with other fixatives other than formaldehyde? Could you use ethanol or methanol? So you can use methanol, uh, but if your application is a downstream proteomics, 
then fixing with methanol, you might lose some of your proteins. As far as I know, that precipitates the proteins, and I don't know how they would survive the washes after that. But methanol works well. You could actually do the fish faster if you do it with methanol fixation. Cool. So we should, eva we should evaluate it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other questions for Sarah? Well, let's thank her one again, once again.